Welcome back to your Daily Dose. By now, you know this guy. He's my pal. This is Jose, uh, our friend from UT Austin, a master and uh, professor of robotics. And we're talking about the integration of robotics with healthcare. And in particular, now we're talking about communication between the robot and the human. And you were mentioning some implants, I think, when we were last speaking. In, in the Parkinson's world, the, the well-known uh, or best known regard to that would probably be uh, the deep brain stimulation, right? Where we have, we have nodes placed and then that electrical system works to, to help, you know, a, a myriad of motor um, uh, symptoms that people have. And it's highly successful and in fact, considered standard of care at this point. So that has come a long way. So is that type of thing, like you mentioned, uh, an electrode plant that, you know, in this one is working directly with the brain and, and you know, off of a battery pack here, is that something that that model or is it related what you're talking about with a robotic piece that could help smooth out, you know, other actions? Well, this is this is an example. It is not the the wish of way that you we use those electrodes. Why? Because in the case of deep brain stimulation, as the name says, it, it is an electrode that it is implanted in a very particular area of the brain in order to deliver electrical currents that will compensate for the misworking of the circuit that is involved in the in Parkinson in this particular case. Now, in order to communicate with the robot, we need to read out, not simply stimulate the brain. So we will be using eventually similar electrodes if they are implanted, that rather than stimulate, will be reading, which is the uh, uh, electrical activity of the neurons around that are encoding some intention or some state of the person, in this case, the patient. So that if we know, for example, that because of the location of that electrode in Parkinson's in particular patient, we observe a pathological pattern of brain electrical activity, this is indicating that the patient is suffering the symptom. For example, tremor. Right. So this is a good moment to activate the robot to say stiffer, make it stiff so that we will stop the tremor. So, okay, so there, there's, a, there's a particular example of, of a space, like you said, working with a particular area of the body. We, 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 we're, we're mapping the brain basically, right? And exactly. saying this does that and, and this is where we are. Let me ask you this, does the, the, the concept of neuroplasticity and the rewiring of, of our brains as people do, does that affect how robots will communicate? In other words, Daniel Eagleman from um, uh, Stanford, he talks about like putting implants in other areas of the body so that we could hear from other areas. That's that's a rewiring too. It's not a robotic, uh, it is an external device, however. Is that similar kind of thing so we could access different parts of our brain to do maybe the same thing? So, or... Yes, so we have the central nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and the spine, because right. the spine is, a, is an extension of our brain. But now, from the spine, there are nerves, and these are the peripheral nerves, that branch out to the different muscles of our body. And it is the activity that is initiated in the cortical areas that tra tra go through the deep areas of our brain via the spine, and then start reaching out. So if I have electrodes in the peripheral parts of my body, I can sense also this electrical activity of the peripheral nerves. And eventually I can sense, because these peripheral nerves are connected to the muscles. And it is the activity of these peripheral nerves that will cause the contraction of the muscle that will induce the movement that we want to do. Right. Now, if I am reading the electrical activity in the peripheral nerves or in the muscles, that is an, it is the final stage of this um, path, electrical path that finishes in the muscle, I can also understand whether or not there are pathological movements. And there, I can activate 
technology, and I call it robots, but remember, this is not a usual robot. This is, this is what we call exoskeletons yes. that are actuators. Actuators simply mean uh, some kind of structures that have motors that, uh, as any robot, can initiate a movement, can block a movement, uh, can rotate in a way, can rotate in another way, faster, slower, et cetera, et cetera. So if you, if you look at that in this way, they say this is a robot, even if it doesn't have a structure of a robot. Yeah, and, and I love that concept, the idea of the exoskeleton to, you know, like you said, accent what, for whatever reason, is disconnected. And there's a case study in, uh, in the sports world of an athlete by the name of Peyton Manning. Are you familiar with him, a quarterback no. of football? He had, a, he had a severe neck injury that caused nerve damage to the point where it looked like he was no longer going to be able to play. And it was very experimental, I think, in about 2013 or 2014, some of the nerve rehabilitation they were doing to do exactly what you're talking about. Now, he didn't end up with an exoskeleton. It wasn't that far damaged. He was able to rehabilitate to the point where he was able to play again. And that whole idea of rewiring the pathway or grabbing it from the nerve and working outward um, was fascinating, and uh, I know what ten years later we're a lot further down the path. We we I know typically used to think that the brain was you know done what it was done doing after growth, and that cells were only going so far. Now we're recognizing that in fact, like you said, we can tap into and communicate with signals in different ways, especially in these exciting um, exoskeleton type of ways that you know can help so many people. I, I know we're over time, but let me just end with this for you. W your particular area of study was, I, I think I read about one of your, it was a chair that I read about, like a wheelchair, a motorized wheelchair. Can you tell right. me anything like one, one particular project you're on that you're excited about at the moment? Well, we have this project with the wheelchair. Um, in that case, uh, we use the technology that it is called brain computer or brain machine interface, because we are uh, interfaces the brain with these electrodes. In this particular case, it is non-invasive, so we are simply putting the electrodes in contact with the head. We are interpreting the intention of the subject. In this case, they were highly tetraplegic people. Um, tetraplegic, I think, in the U.S. is quadriplegic, so complete paralysis from the neck down. Um, but then they still can imagine the movements that they want the wheelchair to accomplish, turn right, turn left, uh, etc. So we were decoding those intentions and we were sending those commands to the wheelchair. The wheelchair is a robot that has sensors and now like you and me, we can interpret what does it mean to turn left when there is a, a doorway. So this means go through the doorway to the left, isn't it? I Whereas if there is an, a, a chair and a table and I turn, I, I tell my wheelchair turn right, well, it will go in the space between the table and, and, and the chair. So this is the interpretation, artificial intelligence, that the wheelchair is making from the command that the human is sending to the wheelchair. Um, right. So this is, this is to provide, to give back mobility to people who cannot. Uh, move by themselves because they are for life. Right. And so now, again, we're talking really about restoring life at that point, because for people who often feel stuck, and this is I'll just close with this, in Parkinson's, uh, you know, you're not talking about maybe being a quadriplegic necessarily, but you're talking about feeling like a prisoner in your own body, that basically you can't do the things you're used to doing, that things that can restore quality of life that can make you feel more whole, more complete, more able to access. Um, it really is the difference between uh, existing and living. So yeah. Jose, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your work. And uh, where, where can we keep up with you and, and what you're up to? What's the best place to check out your information? The best place is uh, to visit my website, uh, the website of my lab, where we are uh, populating new studies, news, uh, most probably I will be adding these uh, episodes. Perfect. I'll put that in the chat below those who want to check it out. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been your Daily Dose. Thanks to everyone.